and I'll just in welcome everybody officially for the recording to our first Python workshop of NHS R Community 2023 conference. There's a word I missed out there, conference. Okay, I'm going to pass to you in now. Thanks, Zoe. Yes, so we've just started the recording, but my name is Yuen um, and I am the data scientist for Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. And we're here for the Creating an API with Python and Fast API workshop. Okay, so we've just introduced ourselves to each other. Um, we have a variety of different uh, Python levels of skill, um, some really great emoji choices in there. Um, so what we wanted to get across with this workshop is not just um, for us to be able to interact as well. So nobody's raised that they can't use Python on their machines, which is promising, really promising, and hasn't always been the case in other online workshops that I've done. So let's see how we get along, because um, it's going to be really hands-on um, with lots of chance to practice yourself. Okay, so the GitHub repository is there, and you're welcome to fork it, and I've also shared the link to the slides in the chat. Um, so the main aim for today's session is to, these are the three main learning outcomes that I listed. So you will be able to query APIs with the Python request library. So before we can make our own API, we, I just wanted to you know, be clear on what an API is and so that everybody's on the same page. Then we're going to make our own basic API using fast API and um, deploy it locally using Uvicorn. So um, there are other um, packages available as well for creating APIs, but the one I've gone for is Fast API because I think it's a really good beginner one um, to get started with. So let's just uh, go over what an API is in the first place. Um, so API stands for Application Programming Interface. Um, and I like to think of it as a gateway to something else. So we can send requests to an application and interact it through the API. So we might have, for example, um, we might have, for example, an API that's looking at um, recording of all the different flight prices. So when you're when you're looking for holidays and you want to um, find out more information about um, the, what the cost of the flights might be. Um, what you can do is you can send a request to the flight. You can also go on the website and when you put in the information about what the flight is, like when where you're trying to fly to and the dates of your flights, it will send across a request via the API um, to wherever the web server is running in the background. And that will return some other information, which then you see. So the API is like a gateway, maybe into a server or into some kind of program elsewhere. Um, which kind of talks in computer language um, in a way that other programs can understand. So it's not very really intended for us to read the data from an API. It's more from other programs to read it. Has anybody used APIs before? And which APIs have you used? Or is it like a completely alien concept? Feel free to unmute yourself if you're comfortable with doing that. I, yeah, I've I've used APIs a few times, um, okay. various sources. So, a, uh, Ordnance Survey, Met Office, um, uh, yeah, a few others that I can't quite remember. But yeah, I've I've used quite a few. Uh, Twitter as well. Um, I've tried mm. and Reddit. Reddit. I've tried using some social media APIs back in the days when Twitter allowed their API <laughs> to, be, yeah. to be accessed. Um, but yeah, yeah, I've accessed a few. Yeah. Awesome. So can you give me an example of what you do with the Twitter API? Just so people have like a more concrete idea of what, what's achievable with an API. Uh, so I was doing a search. So we were trying to do um, a surveillance of um, influenza-like symptoms um, it, using social media. So we did a search for search terms that match certain symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, yeah, it's using the, it's basically doing a search with a, within a particular um, time period and then just looking for tweets that matched any particular these any particular phrases or search terms awesome so yeah. it was like basically like the search interface except instead of the search, yeah the, like for a computer to use that interface right rather than for us to like manually type in the search into the search bo boxes yeah it was an yeah, easier right. way of like accessing the behind the scenes information of yeah because we, we wanted to access it on a routine basis so we wanted to set up a protocol that could just access that on a on an automated basis awesome yeah great 
Um, does that make sense to other people of what an API is? Or uh, just let's, uh, one example might be, um, I, we will show some practical examples of what APIs are behind the scenes in a second. So maybe it might make a little bit more sense then. Um, that's really cool with the COVID dashboard. Hannah, do you want to tell us a bit more about, about what that was and what kind of information do they have on the COVID dashboard API? Uh, well, there are a lot of metrics like um, new case incidents and like testing, vaccination. There used to be more when like um, testing was mandatory, but now there are bits. Yeah, I can imagine like it's it's really died down now probably. So it was what sort of things like what did you mention like so they were were updating it daily with with different stats is that right? Yeah. Uh, okay, that's very cool. Um, and we have a question from Diana about uh, whether to access the coding workbook you need to create a GitHub account. So you don't need to. Um, if so, it depends. Like I created that because. I wanted to have a way for you to run Python if you don't have Python on your machine. With um, GitHub, you can set like a virtual machine up. If you can't code on your local machine, you connect to a magic computer provided in the cloud by GitHub. Um, so you you only need a GitHub account if you want to use the version, like the, the virtual machine provided by GitHub. They call it GitHub Code Spaces. Um, but if you have um, Python in your local machine, Diana, you don't you don't need to have a GitHub account yourself. So if you can, you can just download everything from that public repository to your local machine, Diana, if you need to. I see. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. I am creating the account just in case anyway. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, no worries. It's really helpful. I mean, it's you know, GitHub having a GitHub account is really helpful um, because then you can copy things from other people's repositories and you've got, you know, you've got somewhere to upload your stuff um, as a nice saving point. Okay, so um, with APIs, there are lots of different things you can do. Um, so most of the time you can do, you can see these here, get, post, delete, and put. So you are different things that you can do normally with an API. You can, um, a get request is when you're just reading information. A post request is when you're adding information to the API. Um, delete's pretty self-explanatory is when you're de deleting some information or some resource um, using the API. Um, so what we're going to be focusing on today is just get, just reading. Um, we're going to have quite like a basic approach. So, and another key thing to note is the way that we send the information across. So we're here with a client. We might send a request over to the server. And we usually, from most APIs, get the response back in a lovely format called JSON. So, which I'll go into JSON in a minute. So we're going to start off with this really, really simple API. Um, it's meowfax.herokuapp.com. And I'm going to just click on that URL, and it will take me over there. So this super cool API delivers different facts about cats um, every time we refresh the page. So every time we act, we um, we query this API, we send a request across, we're going to get back a different fact about cats. So if I press F5 or this little refresh button, I'm going to get a different fact about cats. So this is a really, really basic API that we're just going to play around with. Obviously, if it was something more useful, like I, I don't know, arguably this is very useful, but there might be other APIs um, so like the COVID dashboard where you'd get much more complicated data back. Um, but we're just going to use this as our example. And we've got documentation here as well. So the key to all APIs is reading the documentation for that API. So what you can see, it just returns a random fact about cats on a GET request. So that's all we need. And it tells you a little bit about the structure of the data response as well. So. Um, with get request, when you just view the URL in your browser, um, that is basically doing a get request to that API. We're just reading the data back. But you know, we're using Python, so we'd like to do that using using the requests library. And the way that we would do that is like this. So with requests, we don't have to install anything. It's just part of the standard Python libraries. So you just import requests at the top. We put in the URL that we're trying to query over here. 
And then we are going to use the request library and the get method from there. And um, the parameter that um, the get method is going to take is that URL of the API that you're trying to read. So I'm going to run this. Oh, no module call requests. Is it not part of the, the standard library? I thought it was. Perhaps it's not. So when I ran it this time, so I had to do cut install requests because I, I thought it was part of the standard library. Well, that's a shame. Um, so the first one that's printed here responds to that. So that gives me the status code for the response. So 200 means everything is good and it's running OK, which is great. Um, you can get error codes as well. So if you have something like a 400, I'm sure you've seen the 404 error when you're trying to view a website and the URL is wrong. Um, so you get 400 types of requests, like that's usually an error, 500 are usually errors, 200 means everything is going okay. And the data is in a JSON format, so that's why I have to use this .json method here in order to parse that response and actually read what it looks like. So this, as you can see, this JSON is a dictionary with the key data and the value is this fact about our range. So that's the basics of how we can query an API. Um, you need the requests library and you um, run it as such. Oh no, Mark, you got an HTTP error. What's your, do you mind? It's how, what's the best way of doing it? If you can share the full error and the code. So that's that's the error I get when I run the um the response request dot URL uh, dot get URL command. Mm. I wonder if it's like I wonder if it sounds like a work security thing. Uh, Are you working off the VPN or network? Uh, I can disconnect off the VPN maybe. Maybe mm. it might be a thing. That you can see that I'm also working on my personal laptop because I didn't want any new <laughs> work like <laughs> security shenanigans to get in my way because all the stuff that we're doing today is very un un what do you call it sensitive unsensitive. Is everybody else managing to get that to work? Okay, you should get this response or well, not maybe this specific one, but something that says data and some info about cats. Anybody else managing to read your pack fact of the day? I, it, it worked for me. Thanks, thanks for suggesting. Ah, uh, so it was a VPN. Yeah, but it, <laughs> it, it, it kept me off. It kept me off the Zoom call as well. Oh, so. welcome back. <laughs> thanks. Hopefully, that's worked all right for anyone. I'm not seeing anyone else saying they're getting any errors in the chat. So that's good. So the key to, to note here is the way that JSON looks like for Python users. It's always dictionaries and lists. Um, that's what JSON looks like for um, Python people. So if I just wanted to access the data itself, I would have to treat it like a dictionary. Um, so if I just want that data, I would uh, access it like this, like a dictionary key. Let me run this again. So I'm just getting that information. But now it's a list. So if I just want the, the string, I'll need to access the first item in that in that list um, with a zero as well. If I just wanted the cat fact and none of the other information around it, like the fact that it's in a dictionary and in a list, you'll need to be able to parse the dictionary um, just to get just that string information about the cat. So that's something to bear in mind um, when you're working with JSON data. Definitely don't do that for my cats. Well, I'm sorry to my cat. Let that water sit for 24 hours before giving it to a cat. Okay. I'm learning a lot about cats. <laughs> this is really cool. Very educational, the session. 
<laughs> so I just wanted to clarify about JSON. So as I said, it's always lists and dictionaries. Most of the time it'll come back in JSON formats, but occasionally you might see things like XML or HTML, maybe usually XML and JSON are the two main types that I tend to see. Um, you get really complex ones as well to parse. Um, so this is the Pokemon API. It's very small, let me make it a bit bigger. So, ooh, it too big. so you can see it gets really, really, really long and complicated sometimes, Jason. So trying to like, within this dictionary, access the very specific element with it can, within it can be really hard. So you'd be like, Within this dictionary, I want to look at held items, and then it's a list, and then I have to access within the first list the item, and then that's also a dictionary. So, like getting down, drilling down to like the specific thing that you want in a complicated JSON um, format can be quite tricky. Um, but there are lots of um, JSON extensions that you can get for your browser um, to help you to make sense of them. Um, I find this one really helpful. To, yeah, just understand what's going on in there. I think everyone okay so far? Any questions or anything before we move on? Okay. So we just viewed the the bog standard um, API without any um any parameters, but that is definitely something that most APIs. This is when you start getting fancy. Um, will accept. So a parameter is when you tell the API what you want from it more specifically. So if we read the documentation for the cat facts API, we can see that we can request more than one fact at a time using the param count. So if we wanted three cat facts, you could include a parameter called count. And you'll notice that that, let me roll this up a tiny bit that it follows the, the pattern where you have the same URL as before, but now we have a little question mark and then we put in that parameter what we want. So the count parameter, and then we specify how many we want to add in. So that changes the response that we get. If I said count equals three, I'm going to get three cat packs back instead of one. So I reckon you could probably increase that to like 50 or something. And other things that we can do is we can also change the language that we get back. So you could specify the language um, of the, the, the fact that gets returned. So if we wanted it in Ukrainian, um, we can say lang equals UKR and get that back. So the documentation is telling us what, what are the parameters that are available and how we can use them. So these are all the languages that are available as well. So as I, as we can see, we have the endpoint URL there. Then at the end of that endpoint, we add in our parameters um, and we can change the language and we can change the count for this particular um, API. And the way that we would do that in code is we add on, we create a dictionary um, with the parameter key. So what the documentation set was available to us. And then this we could change. So I can say three or two or one or 10 if I wanted 10 facts. And then, so each, each um, param and um, what it is that we want are going to be a key value pair in my parameter dictionary. And this time when you pass this across, when you pass that across with the requests um, package, you can add in here, you can add that in as another argument to your um, request. So the first argument remains the URL, and then you add in this keyword argument as well, params equals, and then the name of that dictionary that you use to store your params. So let's have a look at what that looks like in code. So that's just over here. Let me uncomment that out. Let me comment out the first one, the boring one without any params. So we have here URL. I'm adding my params in um, in a dictionary. And this time I'm going to run this. And we should find three facts all in Ukrainian. And if I take out that Ukrainian one, 
If I just wanted the prefix in English, I can just leave it as the default was English. It changes what I'm requesting from, from that um, API. So that's the params of how we can dictate um, what it is exactly is being returned from the API. So what we're doing in code here is the equivalent of this. The URL that is querying has converted our dict into all of this stuff. So it's it's put in that question mark and it's put in um, that key equals, and then all these values, it gets translated from the dictionary into the code here in the URL. So both of those methods are equivalent to each other. We could manually type out the URL if we wanted to, but that wouldn't be as, as robust. So for example, you might have situations where there's maybe like a space inside um, the values and that would be quite hard to put in the URL, you know, and URL spaces are, I think like a percentage 20 or something or to represent that white space. So that's usually better and just more robust to do it as a dictionary rather than trying to manually construct um, the URL um, yourself. But that's how you would put in param. So can anybody tell me if, I wanted to have um, five facts in French, how what my params dictionary would look like. Five facts in French. What would my params look like if I wanted five facts in French? Any ideas? How could I change my dictionary if I wanted five fat facts in French? Is French an option? It's not an option. Maybe that's why we can't have five facts in French. Let's try Chinese. <laughs> I assumed French would be an option. I will wait until somebody answers me. You can also type it in chat. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. So if I wanted five facts in French, I'm going to do count five like in Chinese. And I can do lang. Uh, that page O, I think, was the one for Chinese. Did they have French? Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. I can't read Chinese, but... Maybe that's right. Let's see if it works in French, even though it wasn't a documentation. Ah, so we're getting an error now because I think because I think because French is not um I think because French is not an accepted value. If I just print response, I should get some kind of error message, I reckon. Like a four hundred or something. Yes, exactly. So because FR is not a valid, if you look at the documentation, FR for French is not a valid option or language. There's no FR available here. So that means that when I actually try and query it for French, I'm getting a 400 response for an error um, because French is not a thing that this API is able to do. So that's quite useful to know. Um, for decoding your error messages as well. Awesome. So hope everybody's been able to um, do that in coding as well. And so if I wanted to convert this count five lang uh, that HO for the Chinese, that would this is what that would look like in terms of the the URL. So we change our parameters in the code like this. 
the URL was changing, that we sent across was looking like this, that we were actually querying. Change it back to so five or less than even. So the two are equivalent, but we usually want to go with this, like creating a dictionary that we include when we send our request, our get request to read the data. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to move on next to an exercise, um, which I'd like us all to do together. So we have something called Open Meteor, which is um, where you can get lots of fun um, information about the weather. So let's look at the documentation for this. So the documentation for this, um, let's get for Kuala Lumpur, that's where I'm from, we can get for Kuala Lumpur the hourly temperature and the hourly relative humidity. So this API is getting pretty fancy compared to the cat facts API. Um, it's a little bit more complicated. So let's have a look at what's going on here. So you need to provide the latitude and the longitude. So the first thing we want to do is search for a location. Here's one that I found earlier. So you can search for whichever location you want, but lucky for us, I mean, I don't personally know the um, coordinates for <laughs> Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur off by heart, but luckily we can search for different locations. So that gives me the latitude and longitude. And if I want the temperature and the relative humidity here, you can, this one's really cool because you can just tick what you want and then it creates the URL for you at the bottom like that. Um, so we can see what the end product is supposed to look like for the data for the um, URL that we're trying to create. Um, but let's try and translate this into, let's try and translate this into Python code if we can. So this is what it's going to look like. I've ticked, I want to see the temperature and relative humidity at two meters above sea level for this latitude and longitude. And this is what the um, end product URL is supposed to look like. So how are we going to turn that into, as we said, it's a bit better to query it with a dictionary for your parameters rather than just typing in this whole URL. So how would I translate that into here? So if that's a URL, how am I going to turn this whole thing into an actual bit of code? Yeah. So what would the URL be then? I think the URL is everything up to the question mark. And yep. then after that is, is the parameters. Excellent. So that's everything before the question mark. So the question mark is what sets apart the URL and where you start entering your parameters. So that's perfect. So all of that is the URL and the parameters. So the first one is going to be latitude. Let me uncomment that out. Stuff as well. So we're going to have the first one. So if everything after is the parameters, what am I going to do? Am I going to paste, paste all of that into my into the param dictionary? Or what do I need to do with all of that? You need to turn it into a dictionary. Mm -hmm. So what would the first key value pair be? Uh, latitude and then semicolon. Mm -hmm. 3.1412. 1412. 1412, yeah. Yeah, and then longitude would be... Uh, 101.2. Six eight six five. Mm -hmm. And then what would the next one be? Uh, is it hourly and then mm -hmm. temperature under underscore two m? Yeah. So this one is actually I'm gonna put that in as a string. So you can list all the different ones that you want um, separated okay. by a comma, I think, is what. So if I wanted hourly, this one's, and then maybe with this API, like you can also get daily values as well. So 
So you could, if you want a daily temperature and stuff, you could put that in as a separate, um, like that. Oh, yeah. But let's, let's just keep it with hourly for now. Great, awesome. So we've built our little dictionary with the parameters and I'm gonna try response. So it's exactly the same. So I'm just doing a get request to the URL and I've asked it to add all my params from this dictionary onto that um, request. Then it's very long, <laughs> very long JSON that gets returned because it's hourly for like the next few days, I think. I don't remember how many days it is. There's quite a lot of info. So that's how you do that. And um, Open Meteor is great because it's free. There's not that many weather ones that are free. Um, and it's really, really, the documentation for this one is really, really nice because it gives you, and it draws nice charts for you for the temperature and the humidity um, and everything that you want to add. You get 10,000 daily API calls, which is quite nice. And there's lots of other things that you can ask. So if I wanted to know what the, I don't know, wind direction and shortwave radiation was for for each day as well, like you can, there's so much information that I, I wouldn't even know what to do with it. What did you use the the API for, Mark? Like, were you doing something cool with it? <laughs> um, It's not... I'm not actually doing anything with it at the moment, um, but we're looking to see if um, there are any um, weather metrics that um, that correlate with um, uh, incidences of certain um, infectious diseases. Oh, so, awesome. so like some some diseases like live in soil, for example. So we're, inter we're very interested in some of these soil moisture and soil temperature metrics, oh. um, and seeing if they correlate with instances of um, certain fungal and bacterial infections that live in soil. Um, but yeah, it's, it's part of a wider kind of um climate related infectious diseases surveillance that we're doing wow that's really cool because yeah. i was just thinking like i don't even know why i would need to know the soil temperature but that's why people <laughs> want to know the soil temperature yeah there's always a reason yeah <laughs> <laughs> awesome i think one of my colleagues at not hc you um you can get historical data out of this as well i think um so she was using it to um build a model to predict did not attend at um in in primary and um, mental health services in the Nottinghamshire area. And she found that there was like a, a correlation between some like obviously it was raining or something that was higher rate of did not attend, for example. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So there are lots of different um, applications for, for this kind of information. Um, yeah. And being able to query it um, in a programmatic way is really, really helpful because then, you know, you can just put in the date for the historical stuff um, and you can feed that in directly from your program rather than having to manually find out what the weather was on that day. Great. That's awesome. So well done, everyone. Hopefully you've been able to get that working. Although, Mark, you've had some HTTP <laughs> errors, so that, that's annoying. Um, I wonder if that's going to carry on or not. And I wonder if you'll be able to run your own API on your machine or that will stress it out a lot. Um, Diana has a really cool example about average daily temperatures for site energy efficiency and HVAC units. So is that is HVAC? I'm I'm sorry, I don't have the technical language. Is that like is that AC basically for for a hospital? Yeah, yeah. Generally, kind of the systems that deal with ventilation, heating, and air conditioning, kind of all in one. Oh wow! That's yeah, so that's cool. what it stands for. I think actually, heating, ventilation air conditioning yeah that's awesome so yeah there's lots of uses for i mean the cat facts api and the pokemon api were less applicable to the workplace but maybe the open meteor one um might be a bit more helpful that's awesome really cool okay so we built that one together thank you very much for doing that with me um i think what's next is your turn to do this completely unsupervised and unguided so we have um the metropolitan museum of art in America in the in New York, I think. Um, they have an API to search all of their um all of their holdings and the documentation is there. Um, I'll paste that in the chat as well. So you've got it in case you don't have the slides open. So using the documentation, I would like you to find out how many items this museum holds which contain the word fish anywhere in the object's data and also have associated images. So have a little go at um, doing that, if you would. And let me know in chat um, what you think your answer is. Or if you're having any problems, let me know in chat as well. I 
I think I think I'm just trying to I'm, I'm trying to work out why I'm getting this HTTP error because um the API oh, yeah. I know I can access the Open Meteor API from mm. R when I yeah because I use R normally to access it the API okay but for some reason it's it's not letting me in Python um I keep getting this this error and I'm not on the VPN anymore so I don't know why I was able to access it earlier yeah because it went through one time which doesn't make sense is it exactly the same FFL error as well uh yeah it's um Max yeah. When, yeah, Max retries and able to get local issue certificate. And it's and it's happening on, on, on multiple different APIs. So not just the hackbacks, but also the yeah, open yeah. meteor as well. Yeah, but I know I can access the open meteor through R. So I, I don't I don't think it's a network thing. I think it's probably mm. a Python configuration thing. Are you on how are you using it? Are you on um are you using VS Code like I am? Or you... uh, yeah, I'm using VS Code, yeah. Mm. Um, I could try using my 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 own laptop, but Maybe. I'll have to I'll have to yeah I'll have to re clone the Git repository yeah. and all that. So, but another I'll, thing I'll, might I'll, be, I'll have a go. Yeah, yeah. You can also try and see um if the GitHub code spaces works okay. Oh um, right, yeah, yeah. So they have instructions on how to set up GitHub code spaces on the on the repository. So if you fork the repository, mm -hmm. um here. You have to fork the repository, and then if you click on that big green code button, you should be able to say create code space on main. And then it takes a couple of minutes to set up, but it's basically like a virtual machine hosted by GitHub. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I'm hoping that will work. Okay, I'll try. I'll try that. Thanks. How are we doing with the fish um, items in MoMA?
6.126, making me doubt myself now. <laughs> maybe they've added some <laughs> since <laughs> maybe they've changed their holdings since when I um, were putting the slides together. Yes, it's more likely that I've got it wrong. But, uh... <laughs> I mean, I don't trust my, my numbers either. Um, has anybody else got any other numbers for, for the number of fish holding um, with images? I'll give people another two minutes and then at 25 past we will hold the solution together. Sorry, I'm 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 struggling a bit with the code spaces thing. Oh, um, okay. I'm yeah. just how do you execute a, a line of code? Like you know, like in uh, VS Code, you can just execute bits of code. Yeah. Um but can you do um, that in code space as well? Because I, I don't seem to be able to do that. I can only execute the whole script. Uh, I don't think you can. Yeah, I think you can just do the whole thing, like the whole the whole page. Like, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. And you do just a line at a time in VS Code. I've only ever done like the whole thing. Oh, yeah. I, I usually just, um yeah, I think it's either shift, enter, or control, mm. enter, depending. Or you can right click and then, yeah, you just highlight a bit of text and then Ooh. you. You know, I'm learning new things all the time. <laughs> I thought that was just like a thing that um, what should I call it? Um, R Studio did because I I I'm not very good at R, and last time I used R Studio, I was like, what? How can you only run one line of code? But clearly, this also happens in. <laughs> that's that's how I always run code because I I don't like running scripts all at once. I like to run a bit of a time. That's I think, yeah. I, think that's just, I think that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I think in code spaces, it's the all or nothing approach. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I have to run the whole thing like Python test API. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Anyone, any other answers for a uh, number of fish? Anyone else getting one, two, six or 190 or any of these other numbers? Okay, it's 25 past, so let's go through a solution together. So um, the key to any API is its documentation. So first thing that it does here is it provides us the name of the, um, the endpoint that we're looking at and all of the parameters that we can use. Um, so firstly, the first thing that we wanted was containing the word fish anywhere within the objects, objects data. So the parameter that we wanted is probably this Q1 because it returns a listing of all object IDs for objects that contain the search query within the object data. So that's what we would have wanted. So the Q parameter with the search term. And then there were lots and lots of different options, but the other thing that we wanted is this has images. So if we wanted that just accepts whether it's true or false. Um, so that's where we have true or false, and we can say whether the, those objects match the query and have images or not. So that's where that can come in handful, handy, to, that's the one that we want to add to our parameters as well, is whether it has images or not. So this is what the full um, API URL was going to look like, and then we had to add the parameters that we wanted on as well. So this is going to be our URL. Yeah. That's the URL. And then the parameters that we wanted were, um, what was it? Q. And then and then the value was going to be fish. Instead of sunflowers, we're searching for fish. Um, item with the word fish in it. 
like that. And what was the other parameter that I wanted? Uh, whether it has images or not. So I'll keep scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Has images. I'm going to add on to this has images. And it's a Boolean, so it accepts true or false. So I'm going to copy has images. It's going to be the other parameter. And I'm going to put in false. No, true. I want I want them with pictures. Um, and I'm going to send that across and hope that works. Sends me a very long list of information. Oh, you got one, two, six. It is one, two, six, isn't it? Why well, I got another number the other day? I got 190, whatever it was, the other day. That's really interesting. Um, so if I just wanted the total in the dictionary and I didn't want the list of all the object IDs, I could also just access the total like that in the dictionary without having to see all of that stuff. And we get one, two, six. So you're right, Jake. I knew you were, I knew I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was doubting myself. Um, I, was, I, was, I was wondering, can you use um, regular expressions in, in these? So, you know, if you wanted, you can use like uh, an asterisk to mean anything before it. I look kind of like in SQL. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Uh, a regular expression where in, in the query, in, in the parameter? Yeah, in the, so like for fish. Mm. Well, if you just wanted to include like, uh, I don't know, SH and then everything that included that rather than just a single word, could you, would, yes. would that work or? It depends on the API. Okay. And it's quite unlikely most of the time. Like I think, mm -hmm. uh, particularly because regex has so many horrible, weird symbols yeah. that go into making it. And APIs, you know, the way that they submit the information is like quite, um, yeah, it's based on like the HTTP, the way that it sends information across. So for mm -hmm. example, like with a space, it would have to be like percentage 20. Uh, okay, yeah. So that kind of thing, like I don't think that would translate very well, like if you were uh, using okay. regex terminology. Yeah, um, okay, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so I need to fix my slides because clearly it was 126. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I wonder if it was a difference when I, perhaps I sent the query across when I was playing around. Like maybe I was sending the query across in in my browser, and I wonder if you get a different. You shouldn't, but. Uh, the Oh look! Mm, in my browser, I've got I've got one hundred ninety, and in that's so weird. I don't know why it's different. This one is one hundred ninety, and the other one is one hundred twenty-six. And in theory, it should be the same. We Q equals fish as an as images is true. I don't know. I'd have to like compare the object IDs and see which ones are missing. And maybe it is to do with wildcards and things. Maybe it's to do with the way that when we are using Python. Yeah, maybe it's more, it's more, yeah. more kind of concrete that way or whatever way. Yeah, that's really interesting. Maybe I'd have to check like exactly what the exactly what the URL request that my um, VS code is sending across. Maybe it's slightly different mm -hmm. from what my browser is sending across. Maybe it's to do with the headers. Mm. Mm. <laughs> well, a mystery has been. Uh... <laughs> at least, at least, neither are wrong now. <laughs> yeah, that was really interesting. So I'm going to put slash 126. <laughs> Maybe we put um option C is 126, and then like we can have more than one correct answer in this page. <laughs> okay, so we've got slightly different responses um from the query via the URL, like typing it in, and the query via VS Code. And I need to look into why that is. Um, so we've just done the first part. So uh, when we look back at our learning objectives, we said we were going to query APIs with the Python request library, and we've done that now. Um, well done. So sometimes some APIs require a key, which you can pass in your params. Um, so that's for security purposes. Usually you can apply for an API key. Just be really, really careful with your API key, um, how you store it. If you're putting your um, repository on GitHub, especially, there are lots of bots that are crawling GitHub all the time to steal your API keys because they can be quite valuable. 
Um, so yeah, make sure that you store them correctly and safely. Um, don't share your API key with anybody, basically. Um, that was great. I think let's take a little break. We've been going for an hour now. So if we restart at uh, 22, at 2.40, um, I will just pause the recording now um, and I'll see you all at 2.40. I hope you're back from our short break. Thank you, Nigel, for doing that little experimentation about the true versus the, whether it's capitalized or not and with the different number of results that you get. I was looking at the, if there's for more information, visit the GitHub page. But it's just a massive CSV. So it might be to do with the way that the data is stored in the CSV. I guess maybe they don't have any um. Yes, maybe it's not consistent how it's stored in the CSV, if it's true as a capital letter or not. Um, I would have thought it should be case insensitive, but what do I know? That was really interesting. Okay, uh, hopefully you're all back and we're ready to carry on with our API stuff. So we had to do a lot of like revision around how to query APIs so that we're on the same page before we talk about how to actually build APIs with Fast API. So as I said, um, I'm using Fast API as the package for making this API, but other options are available. Like I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know. I just, this is the one I'm familiar with. I've built APIs with Flask as well, which is another lightweight um, web framework. It's just really easy to get started with. Fast API and it's got like a lot of good packages that go around with it in the good ecosystem. Um, so uh, the way that we're going to do that is we're going to start off in a file called main.py, which I started with a template in the GitHub repository. And then from here, um, I'm going to do from Fast API import Fast API, the class, from the package import the class. And then I'm going to initialize the app just like that. App equals fast API, so instantiate that class. And the most people would call it app, like that's just the um the, the convention, I guess, that you'll see a lot in the in other examples of people's code and stuff. And then all we need to do is um, I'm just gonna start with the root endpoint, and all it's going to do is gonna return. Um, so you use this decorator. So in Python, um, when you have this little app symbol before uh, defining a function that's called a decorator. So this changes the behavior of your function and then basically turns it into, into the endpoint, what's going to be returned when you access this endpoint. And then I'm just going to define a really simple function that's going to just return um, this dictionary. Okay, true. So that's all we need to do to get our API working. It's really short and simple like this. From fast API, import the class, instantiate the class. Most of the time you're gonna call it app. And then I'm just gonna define a really basic one. So it's gonna be just at the root endpoint. So it's just a slash. Um, and I'm going to, um, it's all it's gonna return here is okay true. So it's not gonna accept any parameters right now. It's just going to, um, yeah, it's just gonna return just a really simple message. So if I try to run this file, absolutely nothing is going to happen. Um, and that's because we need to host it locally on our machines. Um, and that's where Uvicorn comes in. So you'll notice I haven't imported Uvicorn at all here in my um, in my API file. Um, but I need to use Uvicorn to run this. So the way that I would do that in here is I would do Uvicorn. And then here's where it gets a little bit uh, depending on what your computer is set up like, and your filing. So the first thing you type in is the name of the file containing um, your app. So in this case, we're called main.py. And then, so main, the name of the file, and then uh, colon, and then the name of the app. So in this case, we called it app. So if I had called it, I don't know, fast app, then I would have to put fast app in here um, when I'm trying to run it. 
And then the other thing that I normally do is dash dash reload. So that means that um, when Uvicone is running this locally on my machine, if I make any changes to my code, to my API code, it will automatically reload those changes. I don't have to like keep um, refreshing my Uvicone or keep like reloading it. So that's why um, this is really good. It will automatically detect any changes in the code and update what's happening locally. So as it says, it is you know, when you run it, if you're running it in VS Code, then you should get this little pop-up that says your application running on port, whatever is available. Fingers crossed your, uh, your uh, environment on your work machines allows you to do all of this stuff. Um, if you're using the code space as one, you might have to do um, Python dash M because sometimes it struggles to find Uvicorn. Um, so this is what you do. And then I click on that to open in browser. And I can see my really simple API at the home page. Um, that is just returning that message. And big thanks to my reload command. If I say, okay, it's going to say wonderful. Now, if I save this, you can see that um, all of that is reloading and restarting up again. Um, and now if I refresh my API URL, it should have changed to the new thing that I specified, which is wonderful rather than true. So it's so easy to build a really basic one um, where without it doesn't take any parameters in, like just less than less than 10 lines of code, and you've got something that runs locally on your machine. Is everybody able to get this running? Sometimes there are issues with port forwarding and things like that. And I will bring back the slide that has the code for actually running it in your machines. I can have like some kind of emoji to show that it is working locally. That would be really good. Awesome, I'm glad that's working for me. Awesome. So if I was to do, so if I was to change um, this file from main.py to like my app.py, and I was to change this bit of code to um, a cool app. <laughs> So what would I need to change to run it with Uvicorn here? You need to change um, main to my app and then yes. app to cool underscore app. Yes, exactly. I just wanted to like really drive home like the relationship between what's happening in our Python file and what's happening in the in the command that you run with Uvicorn. So I'm not really going to talk too much about Uvicorn today. Like it's just uh, it's just uh, an example for it's just an example for um, showing us how to run it locally on our machines because most of the time you will deploy somebody else will take care of the hosting on the servers like towards the end of this workshop we'll talk about all the different hosting um, options but um, if we're just running it locally is obviously really important to test um, locally um, we can use Ubicon and then the name of the file and then the name of the um the name of the app that you've decided to give in your file. Oh no, Mark, you're having a terrible time with the um ID problem today. Access denied. That really sounds like a work security thing. Yeah, I think I'll I'll try switching to the code spaces again. Mm. And code spaces, um, yeah. let me just give you this. You have to preface the Ubicorn with this. Uh, it has to say uh, Python dash M first because I think some, sometimes it struggles to find. Why isn't it typing? Every time I type stuff, like it moves away from the chat box. Really annoying. Why is it doing that? Stuff? Okay, so if you're doing it in the code spaces, I found it struggles to find Uvicorn. So you have to preface it with Python dash M and then it, because it doesn't know where the path to Ubicorn is on the code spaces very well, which is quite annoying. Uh, okay. 
okay, let's hope that runs okay for you on code spaces. What what's what's really cool about code spaces is that it will also like forward the port for you. So actually on yours, you might not get this address. It will be different as well if you're using code spaces. It won't be 127.0.1.1. Cool. So we've done a really basic one. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is going to add different endpoints. So we've just done a root endpoint and, and now we're going to add different ones. So if we have a look at um, the different options, so you'd use the decorator again, but this time with your decorator, um, you would specify the name of the different endpoint that you want. So in this case, potatoes, and then it works exactly the same way. You just define the function um, that you want and the information that you want to return um, afterwards. So the name that corresponds to what the public is going to see or the user of your API is going to see, which matters is this one that goes in the decorator. I could change this to anything in the function. So the function name could be anything. That's not important. The part that determines the name of the endpoint that your user sees is the bit that goes in the decorator part. Yeah. So let's try this in practice. So here we have an example where I'm adding an endpoint called potatoes, um, which has a function also called potatoes. Um, which will return this dictionary um, and a list. So let's have a look at that. If I have a look, go back to my endpoint here. And this time, instead of the root one, I'm going to add one of the potatoes. Access the potatoes endpoint for my um, API. We get exactly what I said um, that we define in the function. So ways to cook and then a variety of ways to cook potatoes. So you'll notice if I change the name of this function, so let's say I called it uh, open source, the name of my um, endpoint doesn't change. So although I change the name of the function, the endpoint doesn't change at all. But if I change it in here, uh, then, this is the part, as we said, that, det that determines the name of the endpoint. So if I change that now, the potatoes endpoint is not going to exist anymore. So if I refresh this, I'm going to get an error. That's not found. So I've changed the name of it to the Sam special. So now this endpoint actually lives Sam underscore special. And that's where that lives. So I just wanted to like really illustrate um, the relationship between the names that we give things in our Python file and what that actually looks like in practice in the API um, itself. So name that matters is inside the decorator function. So hopefully that works okay for everyone. For any problems, any questions, feel free to stick them in the chat. So I've just been accessing them in my browser here, but obviously we can also access it with our code. So in my case, uh, it has deployed to this web address, but that's not always, uh, it really depends on what your computer settings are. Like this is usually the default, but um, it may be a different port on your machine, depending on what's happening on your machine. So, um, uh, well, whatever you're coding on should tell you where where it has been deployed to. It will usually say, um, when you run the ubicon command, it will usually tell you on what, um, which port and what the IP address and things it lives on. So just double check what the default is for you. But what I wanted to show you was that obviously we can also query all of this stuff um, with, you know, with Python as we have been doing before. So let's have a look at this. Instead of doing meow facts, I'm going to put in that weird URL. And then I'm going to print the response.json. Let's see if this runs okay. I should probably have done that in a different terminal. Let me open it again. Oh, 
Why didn't it want to be this one's that one? Why didn't it want to be this one's that one? So you can query it um, as if like it's a legit um, thing somewhere else on the internet, even though it's just running locally. But it's just a really useful way to see um, if it's working all right. Usually if I'm just testing locally, I'm really lazy and I just click on the URL and view it in my browser. But if you want to do it the proper way, then that URL should work, depending on what your computer is, um, which port and things your computer is outputting it to. So hopefully everyone's got that working okay. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we are going to um, get you to make your own API um, with an endpoint. So I'd like you to make an endpoint dice roller, which will return a random number between one and six. So like you know, roll a dice and it returns a number between one and six. Um, so I'd like you to do that obviously using either going and fast API. And yeah, have a go, have a go and see if that works for you. Okay. And you can give me a dice. Is there a dice emoji? Dice. Maybe there is. If you manage to get that working. And if you don't get it working, let me know what your error messages are. I'm going to give everyone a few more minutes to write your dice roller API endpoint, which should return a random number between and including one and six. And then you're going to talk me through that together in a few minutes. Okay, can anybody talk me through how I would make the dice roller endpoint? How would I do that? Either you can type it in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and tell me what to type, but I will wait until somebody tells me what to do. I'm not going to do it myself. Um, I haven't quite finished doing it yet, but I know what I would do, I guess. 
Um, so firstly, uh, do the app, app.get, mm-hmm. um, and create a new, what, what are, they, are they called? What, what endpoint? Are they? Yeah, endpoint, yeah. Um, dice underscore roll. Yeah, exactly. So that's the main, that's the key thing. So we're using this fast API decorator. Um, and then we're, co- we're making it, we're, well, throughout this whole workshop, we're just doing get, which is just reading data. But I'll talk a bit more about your other options later. And then, as we said, uh, we've got the name of the endpoint as well. We need to put a little um, forward slash in there. Yeah. So normally you would have a forward slash and then the, the name of the endpoint. Um, and then the final function, mm-hmm. uh, just cool, yeah, called dice roller as well. Mm-hmm. Is, is it best just to call it the same as your, your endpoint? For... You don't have to, as I said, like it's kind of arbitrary, but I guess yeah. it might be good practice to, to, to call it the same as your endpoint. Yeah. Um, and then I guess, it, well, you could just assign a number or you could put the, the number into a variable and then put it as a string, mm-hmm. but something like um, random, not round int mm-hmm. one. Uh, and then one six. Yeah, so the random dot rand int uh, gives us the number. I think it's the start and the end. We need to import random at the top as well. Not random. Um, and then, so every time it will be fresh, and then we can just return the num. Mm, will that work? It will just return the number. Let's see what happens. So let's have a look at what's going on when we query it. Oh. But this time we got it as dice underscore roller. And it's just returned that number by itself. Awesome. So every time we refresh this page, we should get a different random number between one and six. Um it would probably be better practice to return it in like a dictionary because that would be more JSON friendly. So it would be, you'd probably do something like this, num is num. And then it would be, it would look a bit nicer because um, that would be better as that would be more JSON, that would be JSON compliant. Like if you just return the number by itself, it would be, yeah, if that would not be JSON compliant. So it's usually okay. better and a bit more descriptive to put it inside a dictionary um yeah it's a it's, that's more adhering to like the style of apis and what's ex- expected because i mean i told in the when i initially talked about this workshop that this um set of uh, constraints that apis should conform to which is called rest so often people talk about um restful apis um and that's because that's a type like the kinds of behaviors that people expect to see when they use an API. Um, so a set of rules of behavior. So um, normally one of the things that we would expect is for the data to be in, in a nice format, like a dictionary, which has like exp- explanatory um, key and value pairs, um, keys, rather than just returning a number with no explanation. Mark, it might be that it's already running in a different tab. Like if you try to run the command twice, sometimes. Maybe. Um, that's why I get okay, sometimes. I'll have, okay, I'll have a look at my other tabs. But, um, yeah. They... <laughs> or it might be if it's, um, yeah, if I try to run Ubicorn again in my different terminal here, it won't work because it's already using that port. You know what I mean? Right, okay. Uh... Yeah, see, it's already it's probably this error address because I've got it running in this tab in this terminal. Okay. So Ubicon is already running. Mm. But I've only got, I've only got the one tab running. Oh, but the one. The Ubicon one terminal. Terminal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is odd. Mm. Did you? Mm, you've only one code space for the repository engine. Did it give you a, have you run it at all? Like, did you get a web address to open I, it? It ran okay the first time I ran it. Maybe if you just go back to that same address. 
the, 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 the sorry the, the same address as as so when you ran Uvicorn blah 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 the first time it would have given you a, a web address to view your API like okay. this one it would have said Uvicorn running on blah 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 yeah and then you could have yours is different because it's running on code spaces so this URL is a bit more complicated mm -hmm. yeah so maybe it might be in your history still like what that is because I I reckon it's still running somewhere maybe you close the terminal but it's still running in the background sort of thing. Possibly. Okay, I've just clicked on the URL, but it's um it's taking a bit of time to load. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, thanks. You've oh, had sorry. so many um <laughs> challenges as well. <laughs> I'm actually impressed that Sony didn't that Sony Mark having a difficult time because this goes slightly beyond what most uh, NHF laptops get comfortable with most of the time. Okay, that's great. So that's how we would do that. So recommendations are to use like dictionaries and lists. So that is JSON compliant. Um, and this is like, yeah, we've practiced making new endpoints. Awesome. So the next thing I would like this to try and do is to make an API endpoint which accepts parameters. So as we saw previously, um, this is start where your API is starting to get more fancy and where we want to be able to, um, yeah, just have a more functionality for our end users. So the way that we would do that is when you're defining your API, this time when you define your function, you want to specify um, some kind of uh, argument for your function. So in this case, I'm gonna define the argument, um, define a function called hello for the endpoint hello. And I'm going to make it accept this argument name. So that's what um, determines what the, the params that your that your API can accept. Then I'm just going to put that into a string here. So that's how you make it more flexible for um, your users. You put in different um, arguments into the function that's part of your API. So let's have a look what's happening here. So app.get, another simple .get, hello endpoint. And this time it's going to take a name argument as well. And then I'm going to return a string. Um, well, I'm going to return a dictionary, which is only one says with the key. And then the value is hello there. And I'm going to insert that. In. So let's have a look at what that would look like with my name. That's what that would look like with name equals un, and you can put in any old name. And suddenly we're getting a much more flexible API, which is um, able to take different um, values depending on what the API user is accepting, that sort of thing. So obviously um, we can then have more um, flexibility and you can accept things that are more exciting than just names that get spat back to you, but rather like, if you had a machine learning model, you could accept different parameters for your machine learning model. So for example, if you had a model that was predicting, yeah, like prices of flights, you might accept as the parameters, the start, airport, end airport, and dates. And then you could feed that information into your machine learning model. And then what gets returned is the output of your machine learning model instead. Um, so that would be how we would be able to use that API more fancy. Are there any questions about that at all? So in order to take parameters, all we need to do is um, have them listed as arguments for the function for that endpoint. So the next thing we're going to do is we are going to code this one together, which can take two different um, parameters um, or arguments for the different endpoints. So we're just going to do a simple calculator that adds two numbers together, and we're going to call it the simple calc endpoint, and it's going to have um, it's going to take num one and num two, and it's just going to add them together. So 
what can I do here? I've got num1, num2, which my user is going to um, supply. So how, how am I going to add them together here? Any ideas? To, um, sum equals num1 plus num2 and then return it as uh, dictionary. Um, mm -hmm. You could call you could, is the index call like your calculation semicolon. Total. Yeah, that sounds good. Your your total. Total. I changed it from sum to total because uh, I think sum is already a name of a function in uh, yeah. Python. So you can see like it was green because it's like, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's already a thing in, in Python. So oh, I, I can choose it. Total. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'd overwrite what it is. <laughs> it's like the most common mistake that people make is where they call their list list and then they wonder why all the uh, yeah. normal things you can do with the list don't work anymore. <laughs> so it's the same as why I call it total. Um, so total is, so let's have a go at that. Let's try it out here. So simple calc, num1 is 2 and num2 is 5. So we're going to try and add together 2 and 5. Mm. <laughs> What's it done here? Is the total of 2 and 5? Uh, added the characters together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that was one of the things I just wanted to, to like short fall, short shortcomings of the API is usually when they accept stuff, it will accept everything as a string. So what we need to do is we need to turn it back into um, numbers if it's a string. So you do that by doing like, you turn this into a float or an int or something. So rather than being a string, it's gone back into a numerical data format, like a float or an int. I've done floats just so, you know, if people wanted to add numbers with decimals in, you could add numbers with decimals in with our really cool um, API. And then that should that should solve our problem. So rather than interpreting it as a string, um, we've had to manually turn it back into a number um, inside our function. So that's just something that I wanted to point out, I guess, as the and be potentially problematic um, with with this type of data. Is it um, best practice to? put it back into the, like, to, to return it as a string, or does it not matter because it, the API will return I it see. A... Uh, it doesn't matter what you return it as, I think. Okay. Um, I think when you return it, usually, I mean, if it's a number, I would return it as a number anyway. Like, I would, it would yeah. be a bit odd to turn it back into a string. Um, but also, like, you bear in mind that the people who are using your API could be querying it in any language at all as well. <laughs> so, I wonder if it makes a difference. Let's see what happens if you turn that into a into a string. I wonder if it looks any different in my browser. I expect it won't. Uh, oh, it does. That's cool. Turns it back into a string. Mm. I reckon that the number is more useful than a string like that or the end user. So I guess you depend on like what yeah what would be most useful. What do you think they'll be using it for later? Um, if you um if you queried if you sort of did query on that would it be but but you put it in as a number would it still come back out as a string if that, if that makes sense so if you if you write your own URL requests uh dot get ah like in here if yeah I that to, okay let's give it a go so what was the so if we return if we return a number what would return we do it as yeah yeah let's have a look. So let's query simple calc and we need some param this time. Uh, with num1 and num2. Let's see. Oh, that's so annoying. I've got to go back to my other terminal. Um, Put it like that. Mm -hmm. 
ุมาเจ้าพอเด็กสุขเขาฟิลเรคอยด์เด็กเด็กคอร์ส I'm just wondering what's happening four two two that's a weird one Sorry, I've, I've picked on the spot here. <laughs> no, it's fine. I like that. You know, the whole point, we'll see what happens. <laughs> it's all a bit of a playing around. I got the right URL, simple underscore calc. Yeah, I do. Oh, it's num, look, it's num1, num2 without any underscores. Uh, yeah, that's it. So that's why it was upset. It says num1 is required and num2 is required. Uh, and that was missing from my, um, I thought if only I just read the error message. Num one is required, num two is required. Okay, cool. Oh, it's a mistake. Um, oh no, I've done all kinds of confusing things. No, go away. Okay, there we go. That looks like I think let's do type. So we want sure. the your total. And then let's print. The type of the whole thing, and I reckon it's going to say. I just keep making the same mistakes. I reckon that it's going to say, "Oh, it's a float." So it's interpreted it as a float in okay. the Python code. That's interesting. Hmm, because it looks here. That looks like an int, but it's interpreting it as a float okay. in the code here. Well, I don't know. Something, something's happening. <laughs> something's <laughs> happening behind the scenes. Um, Thank you. But yeah, that was pretty fun. So I guess that was useful as well because we can see the kinds of error messages that you would get. Um, again, you can also do the same things that you would do with normal Python stuff, but you can give it um, default arguments as well. So if, if someone queries it and they don't provide the argument, it would automatically fill that in with a one and a one. I think I think that would also work. So maybe if somebody queried this without specifying anything, I reckon it would fill it automatically. Yeah, with one and one. And that would get rid of that problem of if people don't put the right um params in. So you can set default arguments that you would fall back on if somebody doesn't provide um the correct info. But I don't know. That the calculator requires you to calculate everything. Is that okay with everybody? We went through a slight detour about types and, and what gets returned and how it gets parsed by Python. Um, you, I think we have a thing for you to do now, which is to add your own endpoints. So I'd like you to add an endpoint called shelter that will accept the string as parameter and will return the string in uppercase. So this is what it should look like if someone queries your API, your shouter API with the word hello, you should return this dictionary, which is you said, and then whatever it is that they said, but in all caps. I have a go at doing that and see, see how you get on, just to put that into practice.
I'm going to give you a couple more minutes to try and get it working. Sally, you've asked a really interesting question about JSON type text based files. So, the by default, like a RESTful API, an API that adheres to the REST um, requirements, has to be, it's always text based representation. Um, so, if it wasn't a video or image resource, it would give you a link to the image or a link to the video itself, usually. That's why the API is always generally is always text based, and all it would do is give you a link to the further resource rather than, um, yeah, actually returning any image or video itself. Does that does that make sense? Great. Yeah. So, for example, if you were like if you were using like the Twitter API, like you'd get the text, and then you'd get maybe like a link to the the image if there was an image rather than you wouldn't see the image itself in the in the information return from the API, I don't think. Is there a way to, to sort of like get to like a content of your your API so you can see all of the endpoints that you have available? That's yes. Yeah. yeah. So the a good API should um well, the ones that we're making, I'll show you the documentation in a second, but in a good API, it should always, if it adheres to REST, to this like architectural style mm -hmm. of making APIs, like they should have like a really clear um, structure and it should be really obvious what you can do with it. So one example, okay. I think I re always use the Pokemon one because it's actually a really good um, example of, of an API, like it's really, really well structured. So let me go back to just the Pokemon API. Yeah. Yes, very, very much. So a, a really good API will always tell you, like, for example, like all the further links to the other resources that are related to this one. Like that's what a good API should do. And it should always be structured in a way that um, you can see. So. Um, if we list all of the Pokemon, you should be able to then the slash and then the more specific Pokemon that comes after it. So if you wanted to see all of them, you should be able to do just view that particular endpoint and then you should list all of them. So we've got the specific one for Pikachu here. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this in a professional context. You've got the specific uh, endpoint for Pikachu here. So if you want all of them, you should be able to, like because they follow that um, hierarchy, and they all should behave in a similar sort of way. I know already that if I deleted that that reference to the specific one, that I would get a list of all of them because that's just the way that they behave. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, so that's why mm, APIs are really good. And if they're designed well, like you, the documentation is, is helpful, but um, yeah, you should be able to like, they're quite intuitive also, I think, in the way that they work. Has everybody managed to make a shouty, a shouty API endpoint? Anybody want to talk me through how you did that? So we're going to code together a um, API endpoint that will take any string and return a capitalized version of that string. Anyone want to paste their code into the chat or come off mute and help me out? Awesome. Thanks, Mark. And don't forget slash shelter, exactly. So that's the name of the endpoint. We have, we're going to take a 
text as the um, parameter. And then we're going to do string not upper text. So we're going to turn it into, is that going to work? Let's see. Let's save that and let's query it here. So you've gone text instead of word. So let me try shelter. Mark text equals hello. We're hoping it will return it shouty. Awesome, it has returned it shouty. That's really good. Um, so we've returned the shouty version of that text. But um, if we wanted it to be JSON friendly, we might want to put that into a dictionary um, as well. But otherwise, yeah, that was great. We have taken the parameter and we have um, returned it um transformed in some way so obviously the transformation that you would do in your api would be a little bit more exciting and adventurous than just uppercasing something you probably feed it into a machine learning model or some kind of like analytical pipeline and then return the fancy results in a json friendly format for someone to use does that make sense to everybody we've been going for about um two hours now so i think Time for another break and then when we um we're going to take another short break and then we'll come back and then we will um start winding down and talking about um other more fancy things that you can do with your apis um and yeah, things like security and deployment and data validation and that sort of thing so let's take another break and come back at um let's come back at 3 35. Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, hope you've had a little stretch, and some water, and some tea, and things. I know it's like mid afternoon slump time, and we've been going for quite a long time. It's quite a long workshop, and it's sometimes hard when it's all online as well. So, thanks for sticking with us. Um, so, we've done quite a lot of coding so far, just a recap of what we've accomplished. Um, we started with querying APIs. So, if you haven't used the request library to query, um, send queries to APIs in the past, we got started with doing that. Um, we talked about APIs, just plain APIs, and also how we would introduce parameters to our API requests. And then we moved on to um, talking about how to create our own APIs. So we used the Fast API library, which hopefully lived up to its name. Uh, we used Uvicon to host it locally on our machine. Um, and now we're going to talk about how we can do more advanced things with your API. So we wrote some really basic API endpoints that took in really basic parameters like um, strings and returned them uppercase. Or um, when we talked about when we built the really simple calculator API, how um, the things that are always submitted tend to be strings. And so you have to do like various manipulations to it as well in order to get it to work um, behind the scenes. So that's just a recap of where we are so far. So um, now we're moving on to talking about like some of the more fancy things that Fast API can do. So the first thing is that Fast API automatically generates documentation, which is awesome. So it will be automatically at slash docs. So don't make an API that's called slash docs because you'll overwrite to this one. I don't think you'll um I don't think it'll let you make an endpoint that is slash docs because that's already taken up by your documentation. But if you go and visit this, if you still have your Uvicon running your API locally on your machine and you type in slash docs at the end, I'm hoping that you will see some documentation like this automatically generated. And you should be able to see all of those lovely endpoints that you've created so far today. Um, listed. Um, so uh, maybe an uh, one of the reasons why you might want to um, call your um, function something useful is because that also shows up in your documentation um, as well. So the dice roller, my hello, my calculator. So those were the names of the functions um, that I had used for each of these endpoints. And one of the really cool things about this documentation is that it lets you try it out. So you can click here where it says try it out. And it lets you execute um, the execute, like as if you're running request.get in your Python code, except you can just execute it in here. 
So this one didn't take any uh, params. So maybe maybe with the simple calculate stuff. And I can click on try it out. So I can put in the numbers I want to try and add it add up like six and seven. Click on execute. And it will do that uh, query for us. So it will say, this is what the get request would look like. So this is what that would be in um, in your terminals. Gives you the URL for the given the parameters that we entered. And it shows us the response as well. So we should be able to see, like if I tried, to, if I had done something silly, like put in an, like a string, which our it should break our, um, it should break our functions we should be able to see the errors as well. So it really does let you try your API without even having to use any code. It's just like a point and click um, sort of interface, which is really helpful. So I can see internal server, server error and um, what, what the error is telling me. So that's one of the really, because I think you asked earlier about where you whether you can get like a full overview of um, all of the um, different endpoints. So if you made it with the API, um, definitely you can like it just makes the documentation really nicely for you. So that's the first thing I wanted to show you. So we've just done it all locally for now, um, but obviously there are situations where people might want to access them externally, like not just on your local machine. Um, so there's lots of different deployment options available. So I think some there are some trust with RStudio Connect. So um, it's really easy to deploy on RStudio Connect. Um, they have it built in already. So you, you it's just a few lines of code, like once you've connected your machine to your organizations are Studio Connect. It's really quite quick to deploy it um, via there. Um, there's also all the usual like sub, like uh, providers, so Google App Engine, Azure, AWS. If you're feeling, if you're very brave, you could also do self-hosting on your own machine um, if you know how to run your own server. And that's when you might want to use something like Uvicon or Unicorn or something to to manage uptime and things like that. So it's definitely possible to self-host as well. Um, if you wanted to. Then once you've done that, uh, it will be on the internet and anybody can access your API, not just you locally on your machine. But if you want to do that, that's where you might run into concerns around authentication and security. So um, I would say that unless you publicize your API URL, there's very little chance that anyone is going to find it. Um, so one example might be we are using um, like we have our API URL and there was a bit of concern initially about people um, using it too much and overwhelming the server, but we've only sent the URL to people who, yeah, who we knew would want to use it, like our end users and no one else has found it and overwhelmed it or anything. But there should be um, the person that you're deploying to, let's say you're deploying it via Google App Engine, like you can also set like rate limits and and things like that, the sorts of security stuff that you can do to stop people from abusing your API too much. Um, I would also say that um, you, I mean, like as we saw, there were options to set up API keys as well. So that's built into Fast API. You could also create unique keys for the people you want to use your API and um, make it so that they would have to have been issued a key in order to use your APIs. Um, I would also be just be careful about the kind of data, obviously. So depending on your hosting provider, if it ever leaves, you know, the estate of your organization, just be sure that you know the kinds of data that you're accepting is not, um, yeah, not sensitive in any way. So, but I usually put that down. I usually place the responsibility for that on the end user. So the person using the API has to acknowledge that they are responsible for the data that they're sending across to my API. I'm not responsible for what you're sending through. So um, yeah, it is secure. It's a secure connection usually, depending on who's hosting it and how you've hosted it. If you set it up yourself, I don't know you're responsible for your own security. But um, on things like RF Studio Connect, it's all it's via HTTPS. It's a secure connection, just it's encrypted in its own way. So 
you know, it's, it is secure, but also I would do lots of caveats and make sure that your users know what they're doing um, and know what the, what the dangers are before they send data across. So I guess, you know, you're all going to be thinking of doing this for a variety of different use cases. Um, yeah, and it just depends on, on who your end user you're thinking is going to be. So I just thought I'd also include like a practical example um, of how we have used um, Fast API and just APIs in general. So um, we have our, our project was to train machine learning models to categorize patient experience feedback. And um, we've trained them and it's all fully open source. So the models are available on GitHub if anybody wanted to use them. But we know that a lot of trusts have lots of barriers to doing that. So it might be really difficult for them to like clone a GitHub repository or run a Python package and install it and like have it up and running on their on their local machine. So we made an API um, and people don't have to use, don't have to know Python at all to be able to use our machine learning model. It's just a connection to the internet and they can categorize whatever text they want to. So um, it also means that all of the hardware uh, what do you call it, hardware responsibility and weight comes to us. So some of the models that we trained, like we trained a transformer-based um, large language model, and it's really big and really heavy. Like it's about, I think it's 900 uh, megabytes, so almost a gig, takes up a lot of time and space. And so obviously that's not a resource that um, necessarily our end users are able to have. Um, and so we take on all of that weight and responsibility and all they need is an internet connection to be able to use that powerful machine learning model. Um, so we have, um, you know, as I said, it automatically generates documentation, which is very nice. Um, so here is our documentation for it. It has examples of the kinds of data that people can submit and the format that we want it in to be very specific. And um, we also tell them once once it's successfully labeled what a successful response would look like as well. So that's where the documentation is really helpful. Um, it just helps your end users make the most of their data. Was that a raised hand? Yeah, um, I was just gonna ask, can they upload data in a CSV format or is, is that possible? And how do you do that? in the parameters do you is it do you um specify the the path on your local machine is, is that how you do it um so the way that I've, i i think there might be other ways of doing this but the way that i've handled it is by um i have so the way that people submit data usually via these um types of um, via APIs is with a post request. So we've only been talking about get requests where you're just reading data. But when you want to submit data, that's when you want a post request to get involved um, this time. Okay. So firstly, um, instead of a get, you would do a post. That would be the first thing that you would change. And then the second thing that you would change is um, I would get them to put their data in a CS, in a JSON format as well. And then you can turn that JSON into like a data frame or something that you wanted to read, right? Because normally mm -hmm. most of the time when you're working with stuff, you'd be able to turn, because it's lists and dictionaries and that's exactly what Pandas data frames works with really well. Yeah. So as long as they submit it in a format that you can turn into a data frame, so I encourage them to, to submit it in JSON format, which is very compatible with Pandas data frames. And then, um, so that would go in the body of their request, and then they would submit it as a post post request to your interframe. Okay. I mean, to your API. That's how that would usually work. So I have some example code for what that looks like for... Um, I have some example code of this in my repository. Let's do a little quick, quick detour into how people would do post from an end user point of view. Would they do it all yeah. on the terminal as well? Uh, yeah, they would have to do it. They can do it in code or they can also, it would be much harder for them. If it's a post request, they can't just type it in the, in the, in the URL. Yeah. Yeah. 
they would have to then they would have to start knowing how to code a little bit if they're doing a post. So in your browser, when we were looking at our things, these were all get requests. They're just reading data. But once they want to start uploading stuff, they'll need to do a little tiny bit of coding. Or you okay. can build a you could probably build a front end where mm. they upload a CSV and then you turn it into JSON and send the post request. You could build okay. a lightweight front end with like Streamlit or something. Okay, that's interesting. Right. So this is what that would look like. So um they would have they would compile their data like a list of dictionaries like this. And then they I I assign this the variable text data. And then in Python, when they when you send the request, so previously we were doing request.get, but this time we're doing request.post. That's the main thing there. And then um, we're including with our post request, we're including all that data up there in JSON format. So similar to how we did params equals blah, blah, blah. This time we're adding to the um, to this post request, we're adding all that data um, in JSON format um, up here. So that's how I would approach that if you want your users to submit more data. If you want them, if they're not comfortable with doing that, I would probably build a really simple front end um, where they can upload the CSV and then you can do the turning to a JSON or something for them. Um, so another example is this one, like this is like a, so it depends on your user, right? Like you've got, diff I, like, I try as much as possible to accommodate different levels of, of IT literacy, I guess. So this is for like the lowest common, like possible, like all they need to do is really just use the internet. And then here they can specify the type of question and then they can just type in whatever text it is like my key was. And so they don't need to know any code at all to use this, but then they can only do one comment at a time rather than uploading a spreadsheet or something. And then you get, so that sends it off to my API and the API and the machine learning model run. And then we get the predictive labels for that text. Which thankfully, it makes sense for this text. It doesn't always. Um, does that make sense to people for how people, like why, why it's used, like how you can use it? Is there any other thoughts on how you might adapt this to your, to your use case and your organizations? I think my biggest issue is um, having the server to to run it on. I don't think we we have, I'm not I'm not sure we might have Azure, but um, yeah, that might be <laughs> that my biggest issue. But yeah, I think it's really cool. There's a lot of stuff you could do with it. Um, I think it's something similar to like what you've done of building a, a um, machine machine learning model and maybe just having it as like a um, almost way just just get some sort of automated insights so, so the analyst can drop some data in and then get some results out like that um but yeah it's yeah. It's, it's, awesome. uh, it's really cool <laughs> yeah the resource is hard um i mean if you do have azure that's pretty cool like that's it's quite i think it's quite built in to azure and you should they usually make it really easy to deploy as well so i found i was like really surprised at how easy it was to deploy on um on I've deployed on R Studio Connect and on Google Cloud, and both were literally like two or three lines of commands in the terminal, and it was all set up for me. And I don't have to worry that like usually they deal with things like scaling. So if you get lots and lots of people visiting um, your API, it will deal with that automatically. You don't have to okay. worry about it. Yeah, I think I need to do some more digging on the server. Um, awesome. but yeah, definitely. Great. Um, and then, so we've already talked about um, this really, accepting what your next steps might be if you wanted to take this even further. So we talked about accepting more complex data and when people want to upload um, upload spreadsheets, for example, or images, let's say you had like a machine learning model that was like, I don't know, reading, reading an image and returning um, some kind of information about it. So you would need to, again, your data would go in the body of the request and you would have to do it as a post endpoint. But it really is like not that difficult to do at all. Um, firstly, you just change your, instead of a get, you do a post here. 
um, and then you'd have to process that data that came in somehow. But you could see as well the way that the user uses it isn't that difficult either. It's just a different way of thinking about it rather than a get where you're just reading, you digest, there's an extra bit of information that they need to supply when they are using that endpoint. And there's some information there about how you can do that or my repository is open. You can see how I, um, it's called PXX mining and you can see how we've implemented um, people submitting their information, although it will change very soon. So we'll look at it straight away. It's like an old version but it will be updated very soon with um, our final API. And then we also have this other one, um, which I think is quite interesting. So we saw a situation earlier where our simple calc endpoint broke if users provided a string instead of int or float. So here, if I do my simple calc, simple calc, and if I had the number five instead, I'm going to get an internal server error because um, because it's breaking my function. It cannot add a string with um, an int. So you can introduce, that's where this um, library called Pydantix comes in handy, and it has data validation. So you can specify that both of these params must be numbers. They have to be either an int or a float. Um, and it's, you can be much more descriptive as well in your automatically generated documentation. So we looked at what that looks like in here. So you can see, let me just load this from fresh so you can see what it looks like without me having like loads of stuff in. Like it hasn't provided any like default information in the documentation and um, the successful response that the example that it gives is just string. So it's not very, not very um, in, informational. So when you use Pydentic, you basically set up like a structure for this is what my API is going to return every time there's this endpoint. And it will follow this pattern of behavior. And this is what um, the type of data that I expect to see from my users as well using this particular endpoint. Um, so you build little models for what that needs to look like. And that's a lot more descriptive and informative for your users. So in my documentation, for example, now, it says this is the sort of information that I want. It has to have comment ID, it has to have comment text, and it must have question type. So those are the, the keys that must be in the dictionary that I receive, and they must be a string. So that's the only type of data that I'm accepting. I, can't, I won't accept um, lots of, I don't know, numbers or something in the question type. So that's the kind of thing. And now my um, dis description of a successful response is also much more informative than in simple calc because I've, I've laid it all out already um, using Pydantic in the schema. So a scheme like in Pydantic, you have these things called schemas, which um, are basically like templates for what the responses should look like every time. Mark, you have a question? Oh, it's gone. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, forgot forgot to, I, for, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking about the different data types, like because um, you don't when you pass a string through the API, you don't put you don't put it in quotation marks. Mm. Like so, um, how do you differentiate, say, like a one as a string versus a one as an integer? Um, does that, how do you make that distinction, or do you do you just have to change change the data type when it comes once it comes into your code? Yeah, I mean, like we sh like we showed earlier, like technically it all reads as it all reads as strings anyway, <laughs> but it's more for the person who's using it to know, like maybe something if something's not working, it might be because it was a number rather than a um or string rather than a number. So the way that it gets read will always be as a string data type. So we do have to make that transformation. But if I told them in this documentation that it was a, that I need int or the, the function behind the scenes to work, then the, the error message that they're gonna get back is gonna be more informative. So it's sort of the difference between what we see as the backend controllers of the API. We technically read everything as ints, uh, as strings, but the users need to know that even that mm -hmm. they need to submit a a, a number. Yeah, that they can be sense. translatable to an int. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It needs to be yeah, able yeah, to be yeah. translated into an int or a float. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay, that's great. And say like you want to put like a, you have like a long complex parameter with lots of like special characters and spaces because I think I don't know if you, if you put a space in the mm. in the URL it doesn't it breaks. So how how do yeah. you how do you deal with that? How do you get people to like if someone wants to put in like a sentence for example with like exclamation yeah. marks or question marks and I don't think um, that would still totally work. Like so if we try let's say we try this one. I mean that's why they that's why we recommend people use the params to submit their information rather than typing it in into the URL because then your computer takes care of all of that stuff. Right. So one example might be with the we had a we made a shelter, didn't we? Was it this one? Where's the shelter? Shelter? Yeah. Here. So with this text, if I try to put a space in there, that's not gonna work. If I try to mm. do a H E space L L O. Oh, but it's automatically turned it into this. Uh, that's the like oh, okay. denomination so of what a space should be. Um, in I can't remember what the like technical lang technical term for that is, in the representation of a space. In um, but if we did a question mark, it would get really stressed because it knows a question mark is normally something. Oh. I would expect that to get stressed. I'm really impressed at how resilient my AI <laughs> is proving to be. I was yeah, hoping it would yeah. get stressed. Well, maybe something like an asterisk would break it. Please brace. Okay, well, it's doing far too well <laughs> for um, what I was expecting it to be. Um, but normally, you'd get around that by um, when you submit it. If you submit it as a param instead here, that should deal with translating stuff into the right format for your API to read. But yeah. you should be able to take, yeah, I should be able to take like special characters and stuff without any problem. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Not sure about other languages, I have to say. Like I've only ever worked with like Roman characters stuff. So I'm, I'm really not that aware of, of how we would deal with other languages. Or um, one example maybe is like um, our machine learning model can accept, um, what should we call it? emojis and things as well like that that can be read because it's unicode and i'm not sure how well that would translate in url um but it's definitely something to be wary of and maybe is you know one of the differences between viewing an api just doing a get request in your in your um, browser versus like querying it properly with um a, a proper library and um using the params properly i don't understand why it's working so well <laughs> So I would definitely, if I wanted to get more fancy, my next steps, we're not going to cover this today because, um, well, partly we're just, it's quite a long workshop and I decided to just go for quite simple and then maybe want to get more fancy next time you can do. But the next things would be to try and do a post endpoint so people can submit more complex information um, like CSVs or full data frame. And then the other thing I would do is definitely use Pydantic or data validation, so helping people with more descriptive documentation um, and more useful error messages if, um, yeah, for the type of data that you're accepting to your API endpoint. And the fast API docs are really, really useful, I have to say, um, for all of this. But that's that's the end. Like, I'm sorry we didn't go for like very, very advanced stuff towards the end. Um, we did touch on it briefly, and if anybody has any further questions that you want to raise today, like I'm happy to go through anything. Um, but um, I'm not providing my work email because I'm changing organizations very soon. So it'll be out of date very quickly, but I can be contacted on NHSR Slack. Um, and I'm also on GitHub. So that uh, it's got like links to my various professional presences, I suppose. So if you've got any questions, you can ask me there as well. Otherwise, I'll just stay around for a bit if in case anybody's got any questions about anything. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session. There'll be a feedback form coming out, which would be really helpful for me if you could fill that out. Um, and we will be, unless you've got any objections, we will be um, putting this on the NHSR, um, the recording of this session on the NHSR YouTube account, and that's okay with you all. If you have any objections, do feel free to let me know in the chat or speak up, it's okay. But yeah, that's all the stuff that we've done today. Um, we've achieved our learning objectives, and if you've got any questions, let me know. Thank you very much. This was really, really interesting and useful. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you. That was really interesting. That's thank you. Thank you very much. Can I just ask him, is it possible to share the slides? Yeah, sure. Let me share the link again. Okay. Thanks. So my organization blocks um, Google Drive. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. Join Everything is blocked for me today. <laughs> what's the best way to do it? I guess. Uh, I, I, can... I, I, I can access it on my personal laptop. If I just copy okay. the link over to myself, I'll just email the link to myself sorry. and I'll be able to access it. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not the best uh, um, day for organizing. No, no. Like yeah. I've, I've, all, the block, all the blockers have hit me today. <laughs> But no, th thanks again. It was, yeah, that was really useful anyway. Thank you. Right. No worries. I will just stick around for a bit, but feel free to leave. <laughs>